so apologies for the uh, late arrival by a minute. Um, so good morning, <laughs> everyone, and uh, welcome to the Transport Committee this morning. Um, Dominic, have we got any apologies for absence? Um, we, ha we have, Chair. One second while I just confirm it is streaming, if that's all right. Okay, of course it is. Morning, everyone. Ooh. Right, we are live streaming. Um, we've had apologies from Simon Pringle. All right, thank you. Any declarations of disclosed bill? All right, Kim, apologies uh, from our colleague from Calderdale. He's got some personal circumstances today, Peter. Thank, thank you, Council Ball. Um, declarations of disclosable pecuniary interests. I can't see anybody. No. Okay. And exempt, exempt information, possible exclusion of the um, present public. Dominic? I don't uh, think we no, have any. No exempt information. Okay, thank you. Um, before we start the meeting, I'd like to um, welcome Councillor Helen Hayden to the first Transport Committee. Helen is the new portfolio holder um, at the City to Council. So welcome, Helen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to go straight on to the minutes of the meeting of the Transport Committee held on the 15th of January. Um, any, um, any, any issues on, on those uh, minutes? Any actions? I'm not seeing anyone raising anything on those minutes. Okay, can I accept them as correct and move the minutes then? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, yes, Thank you. So we will go straight to item five, which is the COVID-19 update recovery. And um, I think Liz is going to take us through that and Dave Pearson. So I'm just going to hand over to um, Liz. Thanks. Councillor Rose, I think actually Dave might make a start and then I'll, I'll jump in if that's okay. Fine, yeah, morning everyone. Um, uh, as we have been doing over the last year, we, we've been giving you an update on the implications of, of the pandemic for, 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 for transport generally. Um, and so this report sort of taking you through um, the current situation as, uh, as we have it. Um, I sort of particularly draw your attention to 2.1. Uh, I think we're all quite familiar with the government's roadmap now. Um, but what we try to do is, is, is set that out in a, in a way that it impacts on transport um, because the, um, the, the various different steps that, uh, that the roadmap will, will take us through um, over the coming months will, um, will have implications <coughs> in terms of what... Um, what people uh, can do and where they can go and 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 what uh, what facilities are open for them to go to. So um, and that is sits alongside travel advice um, and and it's quite uh, uh, sort of noticeable that, that at each step there's a, there's a slight uh, change in the travel advice that uh, that that applies and and that will um, that is likely to have impacts in terms of the um, the demand for for for. For public transport um, and the use of the roads um, and uh, and people's general activity, um, so so that sort of sets out where where um, where we think the uh, as the the next couple of months are going. Um, we we're in step one. Um, so um, on Monday, as you probably all know, um, uh, school started to go back, um, and one of the uh, combined authorities' roles is to organise school transport, and I'm pleased to say um, we've we've got through the week reasonably problem free in terms of of school transport activity. Obviously, different schools are going back in different paces, um, but but that's um, that, that that started. I think the other thing that to note um, in the last week or, or two since the the roadmap was was announced is we've seen a slight uptick in in public transport use, both on on bus and, and rail, um, and that may also be partly due to to the weather and the time of year um, as well but um, I think what that does tell us is that um, public transport buses and trains is constrained by the uh, social distancing limitations on its capacity um, and I think one of the things I would flag to members this morning is that when we get into April and May and we've got non-essential retail and indoor hospitality and entertainment 
opening, um, we could find ourselves in a situation where there's more people wanting to travel on buses and trains than can be safely accommodate, accommodated by the, uh, with the social distancing restrictions. So uh, you know, the, the next phase of this could lead us to, to uh, some capacity issues which we'll need to manage with with the respective operators um, during that period. So I think that's a, that's, that's a slight sort of concern that, we, that we've got looking at that roadmap and looking at uh, even now people are beginning to, to, to move around more, um, quite understandably. Um, and, um, and so I think that's a, a, an issue which, um, which, which we'll need to deal with. Um, since the last meeting, um, the, uh, the stay-at-home order has been in place and um, both buses and, and rail services were reduced slightly uh, to reflect the, the reduced level of demand. Bus services on Monday to Friday basis is a, a more or less back to where the 100% of, of service provision that, that we had up until the end of December um, to basically to support the, the, the return to school and colleges. Um, rail services uh, are likely to remain slightly less than, than, uh, than the normal until the beginning of May. Um, and bus services on a weekend are a little bit less than the normal at the moment and, and they will step up uh, when the when non-essential retail opens in April. So, so there's quite a lot of planning around that roadmap going on at the moment. Um, under 2.14, um, we, we deal with bus funding um, and then we've, we've had various discussions uh, at Transport Committee um, at last time and, um, and the, the chair and, uh, and other senior politicians um, across West Yorkshire um, wrote to the, um, the Secretary of State expressing concern in January about the, um, uh, about the current uh, uh, impending uh, financial issues that we, we, we're going to have to manage as, as the year progresses. Um, at the moment, bus and rail funding is, is in a sort of slightly artificial situation where um, a combination of, of central and local government funding is, is essentially keeping um, the, the bus network uh, going um, and the rail network going. Um, uh, it, the, the next phase of this is when, when that transitions into what we call recovery funding. Um, and at the moment, we, we're expecting that to happen sometime in the summer. Um, and there were, we understand that there will be some further funding available from governments to support that, but we don't know how much that is. Um, the government have said it's subject to, to uh, the, the transport authorities and the bus operators um, moving into a, a recovery partnership arrangements. And as we reported to you in, in the papers and previously, uh, we um, were in the process of, of of, of using the bus alliance that we've established over the last 18 months or so uh, with bus operators to, to manage the recovery period. But there's still lots of uncertainties and they're, they're, they're quite big financial uncertainties for the combined authority. They're big financial uncer uncertainties for the bus operators as well. Um, and we, we're, we're not much further forward in terms of, of, uh, of being able to, to, uh, to bottom that out. So, um, so this, this report sort of gives you a bit of an update, but doesn't really uh, take us any further forward because, because we, 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 we aren't any further forward. We're expecting the government to, um, to publish its national bus strategy. Um, that may happen in the coming weeks, um, or it may happen the other side of the election. We're, we're, not, we're not certain yet, um, but um, it's quite possible that it could even be as, as soon as next week. So, um, but again, whilst we've, um, we, through this committee uh, and, and through the chair and through officers have, have put some information to government in terms of, of the strategy. Um, again, we, we're a little bit in the dark as to knowing what the strategy has got to be. Um, and I think, Chair, you, you've written to the Secretary of State seeking a meeting to, to get some of this clarity. So I'll stop there and, and obviously take any questions that members have. I have. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, just to um, to reassure the Transport Committee that I have written to the Secretary of State. I'm really concerned about um, the uncertainty in terms of planning for bus services. And if services are withdrawn, with the absence of a mass transit system, a tram system in Leeds, we'll be in a very difficult position. Um, so there is a sense of urgency for us to be able to plan services and work with operators going forward. Um, so that's why we've requested the meeting. I was led to believe that we would have the funding in place and that the national bus strategy, around the time of the announcement of the national bus strategy, 
and um, so that's not the case but again because it's one of the biggest movers of people and um, the social distancing the opening up of the economy and um, we could experience significant um, problems across West Yorkshire so I'm just going to open it up for questions and comments any questions or comments from members on the report This is a strange day. No questions or comments. Councillor Buckley, I think. Councillor yeah. Buckley. I can't see Councillor Buckley's hand. Is he waving? Okay, Councillor Buckley. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I had an actual hand and an electronic hand, actually. Oh, I can see you now. It's the sunshine. I feel like I've got a halo around me. It's very bright in oh. Middleton today. Okay. Um, it was just one question, actually, if I could. Um, there's a very helpful um, uh, comments by from Dave there. I just wondered if he could remind us um, what the total support has been so far for West Yorkshire buses and what the monthly subvention is on an ongoing basis, please. Dave, do you want to come back in? Um, yes, that's actually quite a difficult question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, just to just to um, just to, to to sort of break it down, um, the um, the the government support is is in 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 three forms. One, there's there's a, a, a bus services operators grant, which is is um, is a, a grant that bus operators get direct from government, um, uh, and that's generally around about fifteen million per annum in, in normal cases. And, and the government has continued to pay that, uh, despite the fact that, 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 um, that the few bus services might, might have been running. So they've maintained that, that, that payment. Um, on top of that, they've, um, they've, they've been given bus operators direct this uh, COVID bus subsidy grant. Um, now we don't have any visibility of how much they've paid out to bus operators. Um, uh, on that, that's that's a, that's a grant paid direct from the, uh, the the government to bus operators, and bus operators have made made their claims into it. So I I, um, I couldn't really give you a figure to be honest, because that's not a figure that the government have, have shared with us. Government have also given local transport authorities um, a, um, a, a a payment under that COVID bus subsidy grant, um, and we've we've had uh, around about. Two and a half million um, since uh, since last year. Um, to uh, uh, with that, and that's basically um, as, as sort of supporting the um, the tendered network that we we subsidise um, to uh, uh, and and to, to make the gap up between the fares revenue and, and actual revenue. And um, there's there's other elements of that in terms of of uh, of supporting. The additional costs of, of cleaning and other things for for, um, for bus services operating the contract with us. Um, then, of course, we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the combined authorities continued to pay bus operators for the free bus pass scheme um, at at the full rates it was paying the previous year, and um, uh, and our budget to do that uh, is forty five million. A year and and our our calculation of what we would have paid if we'd only paid for the, the journeys that are using um, in in this financial year just just about to end um, is is something around fifteen million. So so you you can see around thirty million pounds of of uh, of of local taxpayers' money has gone in supporting bus services through this period as well, um, and uh, and that's that's basically at the. Uh, at, at, at the outset, then that was the, the sort of prescription that uh, that was set out. I think, as members will recall, um, we and other local transport authorities um, and, and members of this committee have expressed concern that that's not a very scientific or, or effective method of, of deploying public money to, to support it. It might have been okay in an emergency, but longer term, I think it needs to be um, something that's a that's a, a lot more sort of structured, uh, and those points have been made to government. So, so broadly, it, there's um, the, that's that's what's kept. It, it, uh, the, one of the, the the ways of looking at this is that for most of the pandemic, perhaps less so in in the first three months, um, but but from definitely from July on on onwards, uh, with a slight stepping down in 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 February, January, February, 100% of the bus network has operated and it's carried um, 
some months as much as 45% of normal of passengers, other months uh, as low as 20%. Um, so that's the funding now. Thank, thank you, Dave. Councillor Sutherland. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Dave, for your, uh, for your analysis, especially about the uptick in demand, because I think that there is a lot of uh, pent up demand amongst the population who have been frustrated about being locked up and are locked down and are uh, anticipating with that roadmap being released about what the future might bring. Um, and I think some of the big things are around holidaying in Britain and getting into local towns and cities and, and shopping and supporting local businesses. Uh, and I think that vital to the, uh, the economic recovery of our town centres, city centres and local businesses is going to be able to provide people with the transport to get to those places. So I hope that um, we can have a really forward thinking and ambitious programme for the summer. I think people's travel patterns will have changed, but I think the demand for, for leisure um, will be a lot greater. And I think it's going to be vital to our economy that we can uh, support people when that time comes, when social distancing might end and, and that, that pent up demand will hopefully um, be a real driver for our local economy. Thank you, Councillor Sutherland, and I think that's a really excellent point, and the reason I think that it's excellent, but both um, worrying at the same time, because in terms of the fleets that we've got, if social distancing stays in place, if the economy opens up and retail go back on April the 12th, you've got your key workers, you've got retail going back, we've put duplication into the system to get our young people to schools and colleges, um, that could be create, uh, creating the the, a storm that we won't be able to manage unless we have funding and um, that we can plan to put those additional services on to get people around pre-COVID we know you know there's those communities and there's some really strong roots right across West Yorkshire where you know they were growing in patronage and those people possibly don't have cars if that social distancing stays in place till August then we're going to have real problems without any settlement coming forward um, but we will keep you updated on all of that. But I think you're absolutely spot on about the leisure market. And it's something we should be embracing and helping people, business build back. But it's how we manage that. Like I said, we haven't got a trans system. And, you know, um, rail uh, as well is, is, is looking at, you know, Sir Peter Hendy, I think he said 20% less trains on the track. Um, so we're trying to work out what that means for West Yorkshire. Thank you. Councillor Swift. Yes, Chair. I, I just want to kind of emphasise what the last couple of speakers, including yourself, have said. We, an awful lot of people um, are very concerned that people should feel, should feel safe uh, using public transport. Um, and, and that's difficult at the moment. But if we're talking about coming up against a clash between uh, capacity and actual social distancing... Um, then I think it, it, it makes it doubly difficult um, for, for people to feel, feel like they're OK. Um, they, 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 I mean, as, as Dave said, I mean, I think that, but this, this thing could hit us as early as May. Uh, and it, it's incredibly important that the operators are proactive about it. Uh, you've got issues such as the fact of um, uh, elderly or disabled people feeling who even though there's space upstairs, um, they get on a bus and the downstairs is, is, is fully crowded and they've got a choice between um, sitting far too close to people uh, downstairs or struggling uh, to get upstairs and then down again later. Um, you know, I, 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 I mean, I just hope it's something that the, 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 the operators are actually prepared to face up to and, and don't just kind of like... Uh, um, just shrug the shoulders and say, well, sorry, that's the way it is. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Swift. Um, we're working, obviously, really closely with uh, the operators. We don't want, um, we want to avoid disruption and um, obviously we'll do everything we can. We're also working on what ticketing might look like because we, will know, we know that in terms of people returning back, though the working pattern might be very different. So we're doing everything that we can at West Yorkshire, but we'll push for those meetings with government to get some reassurances around the funding. And, and, so that we and just, can plan. Chair, yeah. just to, yes. to reassure members uh, on, on Councillor Swift and, and Sutherland's point, um, we, we, we have actually worked fairly 
closely with bus operators over the last 12 months. Um, and we, we, we were, the, the capacity problem was beginning to, to show its face in, in October. Obviously we then had a, a lockdown in November. Um, and what, what we do work with them on is to identify duplicate buses where we can to, um, to supplement the, the social distancing uh, issues where we know the, the buses are going to be busy. So uh, whilst that's a, a finite resource, um, we are sort of working fairly closely to, to practically reduce as far as we can the number of, of, of situations where buses may have to pass people because this is what it'll be um, at stops because because they're, they're already full. And you'll have seen on quite a lot of buses now that the, the capacity numbers on the side um, that we've, we've incorporated into our real-time information screens uh, displays as to uh, how full the bus that's approaching the stop is. So we, we've been doing quite a lot of work around this just, just to uh, to try and manage the capacity issue as much as we can. But I was just really flagging to you, you, you as members that, um, that that's probably going to be uh, the challenge that we're, we're going to face in, in coming months. Um, uh, Councillor Sutherland makes a really good point about um, people being out and about. And I think notwithstanding the fact that we have got social distancing capacity constraints, you know, we do actually have a fairly extensive rural bus network in, in, in our region um, that can help people get out and about into the countryside and, and, um, and to visit places. So to a certain extent, you know, buses are there to be used when it is possible to, to, to travel around. And, and in particular, um, we, you know, we've been talked to bus operators about some of the routes that, uh, that, 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 um, that run to the sort of places people might want to go to, to for a walk or, or to visit countryside. So there's something to probably be done with, uh, with buses and, and, um, and access to, to the rural areas during the summer. And we've sort of identified that with, with operators. Thank you, Dave. Any more questions or comments? Then can I ask that the committee note the updates in, um, provided in this report? I'll take silence, thank you. So item six is the connectivity plan engagement. And I just want to take this opportunity because obviously we'll all be going into elections and sometimes membership changes on committees to thank you for all your support in producing a plan. We've sat through hours of the rail vision, the bus network, ticketing, active travel um, and mass transit. And we've actually produced a absolutely ambitious and rightly so ambitious for West Yorkshire um, plan that we've been able to take out the people. It's something that West Yorkshire has been waiting for. And um, we were in a meeting with members of parliament last night and you know the feedback was excellent and the feedback so far has been excellent because I think you've all fed into this and um, you've worked really hard on it. Um, not just the transport committee, but the portfolio holders. And it's a plan that tries to, uh, that leaves no community behind, but actually tries to address our challenges around the environment, as well as inclusive growth. So I just wanted to say thank you to you for, for that work. I'm gonna hand over to, I don't know if it's Liz and Tom, if you're doing a, a double act, Liz. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Groves. So the, um, the paper reiterates all the work that's gone in, into the plan, as, as you rightly say, and, and, and thank you for, for the many months and of, of work and the workshops that you've all contributed to, to this. Um, so what we wanted to do really was to bring you up to speed with, with where we are through the engagement. Um, we are part way through now and um, have received, um, as Councillor Grove says, there's been an awful lot of um, press attention, which we, we have given you a flavour of that. Um, in the report and we're also now part way through um, trying to engage with people and get them thinking about the content um, in, in different ways so we are planning a number of webinars some of the dates are still um, TBC so we, we will share, share those dates with you once we've confirmed them up because we see this as a great, great way of engaging with people on the content um, of the different elements of the plan um, and I also wanted to highlight um, the um, district consultation subcommittees. We think this is a really good way of, um, of also gathering feedback um, on the plans. So 
the invite has gone out to um well to make to make all councillors aware that these meetings are happening so that they're able to attend if they so so wish in order to kind of hear a little bit more about the plans and also provide some, some feedback um we are as you would imagine wanting as many people as possible to respond um both to the survey um, and to the interactive map because the more responses we can get from people, the more that enriches the plan in its development. Um, and also hopefully if there are, if there are re positive responses, it strengthens our case with government um, for the, the, the funding that comes, comes forward. We are welcoming any comments um, so um, e e of, of any nature through this engagement so that, as we say, we can enrich the plan um, going forward. Um, we're also working um, with the um, business communications group um, and Mark and I were in conversations about setting up something with, with that group to, um, um, to engage directly with, with businesses. So there's quite a lot of work going on um, and um, there's kind of the rest of the paper also then talks about some of the other groups that we are trying to hear from um, and particularly kind of young people and how we can engage those in a, in a different way. So. Um, I, I do have, I have Tom on the call and I also have Farrah from our communications team. So um, maybe Chair, if we open to questions and if I can't answer them, I'm sure they can. Thank you. Thank I'm you. looking for questions or comments from anyone. Okay, so Mark and then Councillor, Mark Roberts and then Councillor Buckley. Thank you, Chair. And just to stress uh, the, the point that, that Liz was making about engagement with the business community, I, I shared this plan with the uh, the LET Business Communications Group. Uh, got, got a really warm response, and, and we're following that up with specific sessions and roundtable discussions with, with some of the business communication group members. We also talked about this on, on the LET board. Um, and, and all of the engagement that I've had and all the feedback I've had so far, it really supports um, what a great plan um, this has been to put together. I think the materials that are there for the engagement are, are really excellent. Um, and, and I just wanted to sort of add my support from, from a business perspective. Thank you, Mark. Councillor Buckley? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I actually spent some time, um, I had all this printed off and I, I, I spent some time reading both the um, the mass transit document and the connectivity document. And there were so many questions I wanted to ask about this that um, I couldn't possibly ask them today. But if I can limit myself to maybe three or four and uh, see how we go from there. Um, and there's no doubt been a lot of work put into this. And I think we ought to acknowledge that. And I don't think that's um, controversial at all. Um, but I think the word plan is a little bit misleading in the sense that, in my view, this is more of an aspiration, isn't it? It's what could be done and what might be done. Um, but I just wanted to, if I can just fire a few questions at random, really, um, on that kind of theme, because I know in the documentation, it mentions the possibility or the probability of spending something like 70 billion pounds over a 30 year period. Uh, and I just wondered um, what the public had uh, had to say about that, if anything, or have they even been aware of that kind of figure? Um, what kind of modeling has been done on passenger demand uh, post pandemic? This is a fundamental thing, isn't it? Because I think if a plan is called a plan, it has to be based on the demand which is expected and predicted, surely, uh, rather than the other way around. Um, who, who would own the system? Um, and mass transit buses, for example, will share infrastructure where possible with mass transit. Um, that's an interesting question, which I'd like someone to address, please. Um, local buses and mass transit we will try to avoid competition. Now, I think most people these days recognize that competition is for centuries been the driver down of prices. And without competition, who will set the prices? Um, bus routes would be recast. Well, who would recast them? Um, uh, uh, and, and what would that be based upon? And just finally, there's a, there's a comment in there, in the mass transit uh, document, which just 
is a single sentence and it says, housing growth is planned for Headingley and All Woodley. Well, I represent All Woodley and that's news to me. So I'd just like someone to reassure my residents um, as a final parochial point. Uh, what is all that about, please? Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna bring Liz, do you want to start? And Tom and uh, around the, I think there's 26 housing sites across West Yorkshire and 18 employment zones in this plan. So I'm not quite sure um, who wants to go first. Liz? So Shall I start and then, and then Tom can probably answer the questions I can't. I can't. So, so thank you, Councillor Buckley, some really good questions in there, which to, to some extent we don't have all the answers yet, um, because as you say, this is, um, whilst it we do think it is a plan because we would like to see as much of this delivered as possible, this is still an ambition because you're right in, in terms of the, the, the funding um, and the mechanisms that, that we have are, are, are still to be worked through. I think just on the, on the funding point, part of the reason for um, wanting to have a pipeline of schemes and have a plan um, which cuts across all the modes is so that we are in a really good place to try and access government funding. So I think we've, we've mentioned um, before that becoming a mayoral combined authority will give us access to what's called the Intracity Transport Fund, um, government um, recommitted to this in, in, in the budget a couple of weeks ago. So this is a, um, a £4.2 billion pound pot that the government will make available to, to mayoral command authority areas. That's not going to fund everything. Um, it's, I think it's a five-year settlement. I really hope that government invest in like they have in, in other modes and see um, city intercity transport as a, as a rolling programme. So this is not just a one-off, but we see this as, as further settlements of the future so that over time we can build out the plans. Um, so that's part of the reason for, for having this plan is so we can try and access the funding to, to deliver it. Um, on, on passenger demand, it's a really good question in terms of what's going to happen um, with, with, with us coming out of COVID. We have said all along we we'll want to keep testing our plans against that. Um, there are a number of uh, assumptions from the industry about passenger numbers um, growth and when they might come back. I think we have said all along that as people return um, to the office, um, as people kind of, as, as we've heard, come back to school and, and, and other activities, we really want them to choose public transport or to choose to walk or, walk or cycle. Um, and so these plans are very much have that at their, at their heart. So um, as well as thinking through how changing travel patterns might change because of COVID, we also want to affect that change because of our carbon um, reduction targets and, and see that mode of shift happen. So Tom might say a little bit more about when we might do some of the, the modelling work, particularly on mass transit, because that will come into the next stages um, of the work. Um, competition and, and recasting buses is, is it also an, another good question. Um, as we've heard um, from, um, from, from Dave and as we've talked about before, we are looking towards a different relationship with the bus operators in the short term. Um, but that only kind of goes um, so, so far, but that, that will have us enabling a different conversation with the bus operators about the network. Um, so it's certainly something we are alive to. And when we say about competition, I think there what we're trying to demonstrate is we want public transport to be integrated and to work together rather than to feel like it's, it's kind of competing um, for, for passengers um, and to find a way for things like ticketing to be seamless rather than for it to be competitive. Now, obviously, there's, there's quite a lot of... Um, uh, Quite a lot of change that will be that will be needed potentially to make that happen but um like i say the enhanced partnership is a, is a step in that direction um and then maybe i might pass to tom for some of the other questions or to build on what i've said uh, um good morning all and thank you for the, the the very good questions councillor buckley um and these are the types of questions which you want to come out through the engagement so we really do want people to respond to the engagement um and your residents constituents to, to respond to the engagement at the open at the moment to, to, to ask these types of questions and, and this is a true um kind of engagement we want to listen to what people say and it might be what we need to evolve some of the plans to reflect the feedback which comes through the engagement as well so um absolutely the types of questions we're raising here are the types of questions which we need to hear um, from, from, from people across West Yorkshire, which is why the, the events 
the DCSE meetings coming up next week, as well as the webinars and 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 the the, the engagement surveys are so important for people to respond to. So we can take that kind of view from people from across the region. Particularly picking up on the on, on the points you've you've right. raised. Um, so starting at demand, um, Liz talked about this a bit. As we recover from COVID, what we are absolutely clear about is that need to address the climate emergency and the, the net carbon zero target for 2038, the regional target to, to meet that. And we really need to see a shift in how people travel in the future. So even if there are less journeys in the future, we need to see more of the journeys which are left used by sustainable means, be it bus, walking and cycling, mass transit in the future. I think anyone who can predict what, 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 what travel patterns will be like in five years time is a very brave person. And I think it's really important to have scenarios about what different, different situations the world might look like in five years time. Um, because until we've, we've, we've started that recovery, and been through the roadmap further, it's difficult to see how, how, how total travel demand will play out. But that need to um, address the climate emergency and see a more sustainable travel transport system, an integrated sustainable system is absolutely essential. On the other points around integration, Liz, Liz talked about this around, um, from, a, from a passenger perspective, it's that simple journey. So if you're traveling from Otley to Dewsbury, having that sing, it, it doesn't matter what you're, you, you have one product, one ticket, and you can just travel seamlessly across the modes, be it by walking, cycling, bus, mass transit and rail. Um, and there isn't that perception of, do I go by bus company X or bus company Y? It's just a, it's a straightforward, sustainable journey across the modes. And that's really that integration between the modes which you want to see come out much, much more than at the moment. Um, in terms of, um, um, the other point you made around who would own the system, well, that's part of the next stage of work, isn't it? I mean, as, you, as you've rightly highlighted, we're at the early stages here. There's a lot more development work which needs to happen. We talk about four different technologies in the mass transit vision, bus rapid transit, tram train, new, new light rail solutions, as well as ultra light rail solutions. And there'll be a blend of those technologies which you need to bring forwards. And then the ownership and who sets the fares on them that comes later in the development process. It's, it's too early to say at the moment uh, how that would work. And that's something, again, as the development work moves forward, we'd be kind of want to kind of work across the region to make sure it's something which fits for the priorities of the region as a whole. And the final thing probably just to say is if, if, if it's helpful to have a follow-up one-to-one outside of the DCSE is more than happy to do that with you, but also with any other members of tra transport committee and the portfolio holders, more than happy to kind of unpick particular issues in particular areas. Thank you, Tom. It, this, to answer everything, Councillor Buckley. Uh, just, just briefly, Chair, if I can. Of course. The, the final point I made about the um, expected housing developments in Old Woodley. Mm. Where did that come from? Um, so what we've tried to do is build on what the local plans for each area have said so far. So there's been a lot of, lot of work with the, the planning teams within each district authority. If there's something which doesn't uh, look consistent with those plans. That's something maybe we need another conversation about, Councillor. Okay, have a look at that. Um, okay, just on in terms of, um, you know, is it an aspiration? Well, actually, no, it should be an absolute determination that we need to deliver this for West Yorkshire, Councillor Buckley. And I think the timing of it is crucial because we have to be ready. We know that we've been here before. Um, in terms of a tram system. Um, but we've learned from that and we need to address the needs of the future and we cannot miss the opportunity to bid into that 4.2 billion because I think your question at the beginning was around, you know, the, what do the people of West Yorkshire think about that amount of, that amount of money? Well, I think that we all know in this room that there's been significant underinvestment in transport systems and that's why we are, you know, lack of transport is such a barrier to so many different things for people across West Yorkshire. But we're even now challenged by, we have to get around 8% of private card journeys off the road and reduced. So we've, we've got to put a credible system there that can transport people around West Yorkshire. The one thing that the public have said, they want it clean, local, easy, accessible and reliable. And um, so hopefully that, that's something we'll all be determined to deliver. Okay, so any more questions? No, 
can I um, can Sorry, we, please chair I'd, I'd put in the chat bar to speak if you don't mind okay I didn't see that Martin okay I'll wave me under then <laughs> yes please all right thanks chair. thank you council vault go ahead please thank you yeah um it'd be useful to get uh, an, an update uh, the report was obviously uh, written a while ago because uh, PADA 2.19 talks about the engagement. And as of mid-February, uh, obviously we're now in mid-March, so it'd be useful as the last meeting of this cycle because that talks about 4,000 web page visits to the Your Voice web page. I think at the last count, there's about 2.4 million people in West Yorkshire. So it's not a huge reach, isn't that? And um, that might be partly because later on, in 2.21, it's talking about a targeted digital campaign is in development. It had been far better to have the campaign uh, and engagement all planned for when we launched the engagement. Developing the engagement part way through may diminish the, the reach that we're getting. Um, and I mean, on in terms of uh, engagement, uh, again, an update, please, if we could. We note that we've had the first of the webinar series, which was on the subject that you've talked about just now, mass transit, on the 4th of March. So an update on that webinar, the engagement, the outcomes and things like that will be very welcome, please, Chair. Yeah, so the webinar, I can update you on straight away. Um, I was invited with our officers to the Reach Transport Strategy webinar. Um, so that wasn't actually the WICA one. The first one was with members of parliament last night. Then there's a series of webinars going forward over the next couple of weeks. I'm just going to bring Farrah in in terms of communications. And Farrah, do you want to pick up any of those points? Yes, of course. Thank you for the question. Um, so in terms of the traffic to the page, the numbers we've seen have consistently sort of increased um, since, since mid February, and that's really broadly in line of with what we'd expect for an, from an engagement as we trial um, sort of different promotion methods, whether that's by social media, press releases, um, promoting through the webinars and things like that. And the current numbers look to be just shy of seven and a half thousand page views, um, which is again sort of broadly in line with a sort of consistent number of people uh, reaching that page. Um, and we've also seen a significant increase in the amount of people um, sort of viewing documents, et cetera, on the page, such as downloading the connectivity plan document. Um, we've also run a, a series of polls or we're starting, uh, starting those polls. Um, so we've run a, um, a poll on views on the mass transit system, which was launched last week in line with the webinar. And that saw a huge number of responses across um, the webinar and social media and, or, and directly on our Your Voice page. Um, in terms of the point on sort of the social media and how that evolves during the engagement, what we really expect to see is to, to sort of um, evolve with how effective the communications are. So um, the, the sort of the plan for it was to run organic social media uh, communications and then sort of look at how well they perform and and we do something called A-B testing, which is to try sort of uh, one video against another and see how effective they are. And we use all of that information and those statistics to shape the next stage of promotion that goes out. And we also look at the type of people who are responding to the engagement and where, where, um, where success has been. Um, and we use that to further target the audiences and the postcodes and the age and the gender, et cetera, that we aim to reach. And um, was there was there anything else on that that I didn't if I cover? if I could chair yeah thanks Farah thanks for that if you could yeah again the, uh, the it says the first webinar uh, presumably run by Wyker was uh, a week ago the fourth of March yeah what was the audience like and what was the makeup of the audience in terms of was it business was it residents was it transport aficionados yeah do we do we have any idea on that please Farah I'll pass that over to Tom as the organizer of that one. <laughs> Good morning again, Councillor Bolt. Um, so we there was a, a mass transit webinar last week last week on the fourth of March. We had over two hundred people attend the webinar. Um, it was a range of of, of people, members of the public. Um, there was media on it. Um, I think BBC Look North had representatives 
on the call as well, as well as a number of businesses. And we've also been holding a number of separate events with businesses, so particularly with the Chamber, um, and in addition to the events which uh, Mark has been helping with, with, with business communications groups, we've held a series of Chamber-led events um, uh, to talk around the, uh, the transit and connectivity proposals more broadly. So there's a series of events beyond just, just one web, well, um, a couple of webinars. It's actually been trying to target a range of different groups um, to try and maximize the input. But I'd also just highlight that we, 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 need, we need everyone's help to kind of spread the, the, the awareness of this engagement as much as possible. We will do absolutely everything we can through social media um, and working with um, partners across districts to push the message and try to get responses. But we need your help as well to try and maximize the message and reach of the engagement um, so we get the best quality of responses back. Thank you. Councillor Buckley, is that a legacy hand that you've still got up? <laughs> yeah. Because I've got Councillor Carhill to come in then. Councillor Carhill. Sorry, Chair, yeah, it was. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I, I was just going to ask a bit more about the seldom heard groups because um, they're the most important uh, and we're, we're trying to um, obviously engage with as many groups as we can through this which is really positive but I wonder if we can expand on that and whether we're using all the contacts in, in districts as well because obviously within individual districts we've got quite a lot of contacts so we may be checking various schemes with we've got our uh, accessibility uh, and usability group in, in Leeds and whether we're really getting into depth with those because purely online consultation is incredibly difficult although actually it does widen to many of the audiences who wouldn't be able to attend in person so that's a positive but then making sure we're also capturing the best of both worlds of, of those who may need some more help in in accessing the the um being able to submit their their thoughts yeah Farah wouldn't it have been fantastic to really get out into those communities um and into those community settings to to take all this out Farah do you want to just pick up on that one Yes, of course. Um, so yes, absolutely. It would have been ideal if we could we could have done our, our sort of standard approach to consultations with, in terms of drop-in events and, and, and sessions like that. Um, what we've tried to do with the digital engagement is to have different methods of providing feedback to really make it as accessible as possible. So we have a survey to provide more detailed um, sort of feedback, which captures quantitative and qualitative views. But we also have this interactive map, um, which is a sort of more quick and accessible way to engage. And then we're developing these polls, which are sort of translations of the main points in the, in the survey into really short, snappy um, ways to capture feedback. So whilst we acknowledge it's, it's, um, it's a digital first uh, sort of consultation, we have uh, thought about different methods of capturing feedback to work with different groups. Um, in terms of contacts, again, just to sort of echo what, what Tom and Liz have said, we really do need um, as much support as possible to, to help reach those contacts. Of course, um, we're, we're happy to, um, to support. We're, we've developed a stakeholder comms pack for each of the districts, which has examples of newsletter pieces, emails, um, social media, et cetera, which is just really simple to um, help disseminate and, and promote the engagement to different groups. Um, and we're continuing to do that to um, try and work with our partners and our networks to explore how we can reach as many people as possible. Yeah, challenging times. I was just thinking at the start of this, if we'd have been in um, Kirkley's bus station, there's 30,000 people go through there a week. It's been just so good to get in there that we are where we are, unfortunately. Any more what, questions what or comments? Bus station, not Kirkley's. What Kirkley's. Huddersfield, yeah. <laughs> you always remind me. Thank you, Peter. Okay. I got the number right there, didn't I? Did, yeah. <laughs> and so Buckley. Is, is that still the hand, or have you got another question? No, no, no that's still the hand. Let me. No, move. sometimes you just, <laughs> they just won't go down, will they? I don't know why. Okay. All right. Thank you. Can we uh, note the recommendations um, and move on to the next item? Thank you. So, um, item seven is the active travel update. Um, so, I'm not sure if Kit's with us today. So no, so Kit's here and uh, Liz. So, um, Kit, would you want to speak I'll, to I'll, I'll start, Councillor Grove, that's okay. okay. And, and yeah, Kit, Kit, come in. Ably, ably yes. help. 
Um, we brought this paper because um, we had a really great discussion at Transport Committee in, in January around active travel. Um, and at that time we had it as part of the COVID update report. And there was questions around um, how we capture benefits. Um, and there was also questions around what, what, what we're doing on the ground, both in terms of infrastructure delivery, but also how we are engaging and continuing to engage through the COVID crisis with communities. Um, so really this paper, um, there's, there's a lot in here, but what we wanted to do was to collect it, collect together all the many different things that we are doing around active travel um, to, to bring in one place and, and hopefully give a little bit more detail about some of how we do the benefit mapping um, and also recognise that we there are gaps in, in our ability to, to do some of this um, and, and where, where those gaps are. Um, so hopefully, I think it was Councillor Buckley last time who had questions about that, so hopefully there's a bit more detail in there to, to help to, to what I said last time. So really the, the, the paper's here for, for you to digest in terms of everything that's going on. Um, and we're happy to take any questions on it. And yes, Kit very kindly is here today to answer any um, as, as well. Kit, do you just want, just want to quickly sort of comment on all the exciting work that you're doing? Uh, well, I can try. Um, I, I will open with a thanks, Liz, for that very kind introduction. Uh, mm -hmm. And also by <laughs> saying that um, Obviously, I, I can answer from a policy perspective on what we're doing. Uh, Rob has very kindly given me lots of information about the schemes that are on the ground at the moment that I can hopefully answer your questions with if you have any on that. Regarding our community engagement approach, whilst I can talk more about what we hope to do in the future, unfortunately, uh, Katie uh, was off yesterday due to last minute illness and was unable to provide me with a full update on everything that's happening in the community front of things so if i know the answer i will present it but if i if i if i have to take your question away i will of course do so and respond appropriately okay thank um, you gosh i was going to say things about what i was doing wasn't i so um <laughs> <laughs> Active travel, as we all know, has recently risen up the um, agenda of both uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority, our districts, and indeed the, the national government as well, and is very much seen as being at the heart of what we want to do going forward at a national level. It's 50% of trips will be walked or cycled um, by 2040. Yeah, our 2040 strategy shows real ambitious targets for modal shift and the increases in walking and cycling journeys. And as we saw you know, during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown, there was real appetite for this kind of walking and cycling. You know, people enjoyed the fact that their streets were quieter, that they could hear the bird song, that they could take their kids to school on bikes, or they weren't actually going to school, they were just going to the park, because obviously schools were closed. But, you know, this there's this real appetite to get out and use our streets for a much more sort of, much more than just storing and moving private motor vehicles. So it was really heartening to see. What we want to do now, of course, is build on that, and to a certain extent, take the community with us and help us reach those really ambitious modal shift and decarbonisation targets that Tom and Liz and others have talked about earlier today. And as part of that, we're developing a pipeline of schemes that will enable us to move more and more of these short journeys over to walking or cycling and particularly enable us that where the journeys are longer and wouldn't be appropriate for walking or cycling individually as you know part of the mass transit work as part of our rail work and as part of our bus work we're making sure that active modes are integrated into those decisions so that therefore it becomes a sort of much more seamless end-to-end -end journey plan as um you know, Tom said earlier with the example of Otley to Dewsbury, at the moment that might be multiple tickets, multiple modes. Uh, whilst it will still potentially involve multiple modes and multiple uh, tickets, what we would love to do is, for example, at the moment you might have to get a taxi to the bus stop in Otley if you live outside it. We'd love to move that to being a walking or a cycling journey. So. Going forward, we have real ambitions to grow that pipeline. I'm in the midst of uh, working on that at the moment. I'm happy to take questions on that if there are any. We sort of talk very brief, brief about in the paper that we have funding to do this through Integrated Transport Block and also from the DFT who have recently announced the latest uh, one year uh, sort of award for both revenue spending, the capital spending is yet to be determined for us. Um, but we hope to end the year with a really strong pipeline of schemes, both in terms of uh, scale, everything from you know potentially large cycle um, corridors where we're going to put in segregated cycle infrastructure on key key desire lines to much smaller interventions to enable accessible walking trips to be made, be that a new pedestrian crossing, be that improving drop curbs. Uh, there are examples, for example, outside uh, Hebden Bridge that 
we have bus stops where one cur- one bus stop is on a curb and that's great and it's got a shelter. The other one is currently, you know, a flag in a verge uh, due to that. Now that's, you know, in itself for you, for you or I, that might not be particularly problematic, but if you're in a, a wheelchair or you've got accessibility issues or you're not comf- confident crossing the road, that might put you off making the bus and therefore taking the bus and therefore you end up either getting a taxi or potentially driving trips that you might otherwise want to do. So we're we're really making sure that this pipeline of schemes we're developing for multiple funding streams is really about tying together all sorts of journeys from ones that we want to be walking and cycling individually to um, you know la- to, 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 to the larger parts of integrated multimodal journeys. Thank you, Kate. I've got Councillor Scullion and then Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Um, good report. Thank you and, and good work. There needs to be lots, lots, lots more. I think what you just said, Kit, about scaling really is a challenge for us all. I just wanted to mention something that I think is missing from the report, and that's the link with business recovery and retail and the high street because of a small scale, admittedly small scale project in Calderdale, um, Cargo Dale, uh, tricycles, delivery tricycles, which uh, in spite of the hills in Calderdale in the upper valley, the, um, the bikes get up and down and do deliveries, actually even sometimes in the ice and, and, and snow. Um, What they have done is they have linked with an online uh, sales platform called Totally Locally, and that's linked into places like market stalls that previously would never have sold online. So they sell things online through the Totally Locally platform, and then they're delivered to people through the Cargadale bikes. And we think this is very important in terms of our high street and our retail small shops and markets offer that they actually have uh, this additional factor of Cargadale delivering. So the florist um, in Tomerden Market might use the tricycle to deliver on the day flowers in a way that previously hasn't been done. And it really does enhance the offer that the local local shops can, can can deliver to local residents. So I think that link with revival of the high street and recovery of small businesses and different modes of travel like Cargadale, I think should be mentioned somewhere in future papers. Uh, thank you, Councillor Scullion. And I completely agree that uh, putting active travel into our business and our high streets is really, really important for so many ways. We, you know, um, I know uh, Beata Cubitt's behind Cargadale very well, and it's a really exciting story that we are using cargo uh, bikes, not just for last mile trips in city centres, urban centres like Leeds and Bradford, where of course, you know, as ever, London's kind of piloted that that works, and we know that it's great with you know pedal me using f- delivering Freddie's flowers and all that kind of stuff. But also, we've got um, cargo bikes setting up in Ilkley now as well as a sort of a market town. We've got Beata running them over in Todmorden in a much more rural and hilly environment, and it just demonstrates that these these are better alternatives to vans in terms of the costs and in terms of the impact on the environment. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention on that front is that obviously. All of the infrastructure we design and propose going forward now is LTN 120 compliant, which means that it will enable cargo bikes or adapted bikes or family bikes to to use it. And that means that wherever we wherever we invest in you know segregated cycling infrastructure or low traffic neighbourhoods or other active travel schemes, we're enabling and um, increasing the opportunity for these kinds of companies to take a, to, to to build and to build these links and deliver more and more goods, especially if we look at how we you know the high street is expected to develop and this comes back to the whole how we de- how we are going to build back and that's a question that obviously I don't know the answer to, but if we look at high streets being much more around also around cafes around restaurants we're going to want spaces for people to spill out we're going to want spaces for people to to be on the pavement that means that we need to save space on our high streets that currently is often given over to, to motor movement by moving deliveries into sustainable needs such as bikes. Uh, uh, we actually enable more space for those kinds of activities and the whole thing becomes a virtuous circle rather than a vicious one at the moment. So I take the point on board, Council School, and I will make sure we mention it in the future. Council Groves, may, may I also add, and, and apologies Council Scullion for not adding it into this paper, but your um, I'd be pleased to know we have added it into our response to government around their rural consultation in innovation. So, um, so yes, apologies for not this paper, but we, we certainly recognised it in, uh, in our response on that. Thank you.
you are on mute. Yeah, you're Council on mute, Kim. That's why you can't hear me. <laughs> Council <laughs> Carroll. <laughs> I'm sure, you, I'm sure it was very relevant what you said, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sorry about that. Is it my turn, Kim? Yes, it is. Sorry about that. Thank you. No, no problem. Um, I think the phrase you're on mute, I'll get myself a T-shirt. I know. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, can I commend Kit's enthusiasm? Uh, uh, it's really <laughs> nice to hear uh, somebody who is obviously committed and enthusiastic. Unfortunately, those of us who are out in the sticks um, are faced with reality. Um, and I, I, I'm, I've been singularly disappointed, I suppose, sir. Uh, uh, in relation to what's happened during the, um, the pandemic period in relation to walking and cycling in Otley. And I wouldn't have raised it if we hadn't uh, brought Otley into the conversation um, about our desperate desire to, to go to Dewsbury. Uh, they, quite, quite frankly, when, when, the, um, when the, the government first started talking about uh, this, this, in effect, using, not using the pandemic, that's a, the wrong word, but um, a, a, attempting to provide uh, better areas for pedestrians and cyclists uh, as a follow on from the, the elements of the pandemic. There was a, a, a tremendous amount of enthusiasm out in uh, Otley. Um, as you know, Otley is a, a, a big cycling community and lots of people full of enthusiasm and full of good ideas, um, most of which the ward members were happy to support. Uh, and in fact, the ward members also introduced, uh, included several other, what they thought were good ideas. Um, now, I, I have to say to you, it's a bit like pushing water uphill to try and get any movement whatsoever. So if I was to say to you that at the very beginning of the pandemic, we were promised some cycle racks. So 13 months ago, we were promised some cycle racks, or not cycle racks, cycle, um, well, I suppose they are racks, aren't they? Yeah. They're storage. Yeah, yeah, cycle lockers or locks, uh, or lockable Sheffield stands or whatever it might be. Um, we were promised those 13 months ago. We were promised those uh, and we were told they'd been purchased and they were ready to go in. I have to say to you, they were put in this week. Um, we put in bids for uh, improving, not creating new, but improving um, a couple of routes through look to facilitate cycling, particularly cycling for young people to go to school. Uh, I have to say to you, it's one of the most difficult pieces of work I have ever got had um, to deal with. We eventually, eventually, uh, after a great deal of effort, and Kim might remember actually raising the issue in council, got some works done. I've subsequently written to our highways department, or emailed our highways department on something like a dozen occasions uh, to talk about the other part of that work, I can't get a reply. Um, so I have to say to you that there is enthusiasm out here for works, but actually, uh, if we look at what Leeds has done, most of that money seems to have gone into the city centre. Very little of it has come out to us. It's very depressing because we have communities uh, across the north of Leeds who are desperate to increase their walking cycling um, but are not able to do so because the council just does not seem to be able or willing to take those steps. Thank you. Sorry for the run. Hey, um, so thank you Councillor Campbell. Um, there's quite a, a bit there that is very specific to read, so I'm happy to work with Councillor uh, Carhill and Councillor Hayden and, and probably meet yourself um, outside of this meeting to discuss 
um, those, the things that you've raised. We certainly do want to help and support. Um, I think sometimes the money was at the emergency uh, funding um, was held back for um, a, a couple of months in terms of the um, that we recently received, received and uh, the, that's a problem. Instead of a stream of funding for cycling and walking, we're always having to bid and and and, and just depend and, and uh, dependent on, on on bidding for funding. We're great to have some long term funding, Councillor Cahill. I'm just coming quickly, Chair, um, from more of a leads perspective that. Uh, very happy to pick that up with you Colin because yeah. I do remember the discussions of Otley and uh, I think I wasn't in all the discussions um, so I can't remember exactly where we got to but sometime summer last year we were looking at including Otley in the plans um, somehow it didn't pan out and I'm trying to rack my brains and remember the exact reasoning but as I say I was in some discussions and not others so maybe that's something we can take up um, and myself and Councillor Hayden can can look at and meet with you with because I do know that there certainly was um, well aware of the difficulties in Otley with the amount of vehicles going through and the enthusiasm for, for cycling especially so I think that's something we'll we'll take away and maybe bring back to. It would be interesting to find out why the um, bike lockers took so long, have taken so long because obviously surely there's a, a real demand for them. I don't know if it's in that manufacturers, but we'll have a look into that as well because that is an awful long time. Councillor Ball? The answer to that if you want. Yeah. Yes, so, please, Councillor Campbell. I'd like to understand that more. <laughs> well, quite frankly, it's to do with council departments. So, All right, okay. Uh, so you need we need to speed up. It's taken highways 13 months okay. to, to okay. find the team who can put the, put the bike rack in. <laughs> okay. okay. You take them 13 months and leave five emails, but you know, yeah, okay. Council, thank you. Council Ball, yeah, thanks. Uh, if I, well, I'll start off with the leads loving if I if I may, Chair. Uh, could we have uh, an update, please, on uh, what progress is being made to improve the active travel provision through Skelton Grange um, on the Trans Pennine Trail and uh, south and east leads route? Yeah. As colleagues may know, there's a bridge there which is prohibitive to any but the, the fittest and most able. Our, our route should be accessible to all, and it's something that Taj and, and I have highlighted before when we've been out the barriers. Here we have a route that's running down the canal path out towards Wakefield by the circuitous route and out towards the Trans Pennine Trail. And there's a terrible bridge, which you know, if you've got a, a bike that's anything above carbon fibre, you've got a right struggle lifting it over. So perhaps someone could update on that. Uh, Kit mentioned about um, the prominence of active travel promotion and it's coming to the, the fore. Um, I'd just like to highlight to, to colleagues that some of us have been promoting active travel and been successful for some time. It's, it's a shame that it hasn't been carried on. You can see behind me that uh, I was proud to pick up on behalf of Kirk Lee's the European Greenways Award in 2007, beating as it says, all the Europeans. So we beat the French, the Germans, the Austrians and everybody, the Spanish. In fact, I, I, the, the award was in Madrid. And we won that. We picked that up for the mobility category. So for the Kirklees Greenways, we're being accessible to people in 2007. And yeah, the fact that we're now yeah, 14 years further on and we're talking about active travel coming to prominence, I think, yeah, it's, it's sadly it's dropped off, but we need to be pushing that back. And in terms of pushing back, Chair, um, I think one thing that we have to be mindful of, and we've talked about engagement before, is when we, when we consult people, we need to retain the confidence in the process. Um, I've highlighted to committee before the situation with the, uh, the much publicised Castlefoot to Wakefield cycle route, which was promoted in uh, 2016. Um, and... Councillor Morley said at, at that time uh, that he wanted people to take part in the consultation to provide a new route for safe and pleasant journey for cyclists and walkers between Castleford and Wakefield. And the route that was, uh, that was proposed achieved the criteria of being direct, pleasant, etc. What we've seen since then is the process um, where we don't get consulted on changes as a transport committee, but the, the Wiker leaders have changed the route. 
so that it now uh, differed from that which was consulted and has gone up through Methley. And then from Methley, it's turned west towards um, Bottom Boat. That's not what the, uh, the public were, were consulted on. So it fails to meet the initial promise. And as I said, detracts from that. I've questioned this because obviously I want to know as a cyclist myself, when will I be able to safely cycle from Castleford to Wakefield or vice versa? And there are good cafes at the end of the Castleford Greenway, which uh, I'm sure that Wakefield councillors would like to see some tourism spend there. But staff are telling me that at present, there are no further uh, combined authority funded schemes in development along this route. So the 2016 promise of um, the route between Castleford and Wakefield a new, safe and pleasant journey for cyclists and walkers. Those of us, unless you're on a mountain bike or solid tyres, have to revert to the road, whichever way that is, to get between Castleford and Wakefield. And that's not what was promised. Um, the, the route that it is going out through through Methley, and I'm, I'm sure the ward members up there are quite pleased that it's going there, but it's not continuous. When it gets to Methley, there's an old railway line to Bottom Boat, which I've used on a mountain bike, and it's acknowledged by officers that uh, Sustrans and Wakefield Council have been undertaking some routine maintenance, but recognise the route requires additional investment. And there's nobody got any money for that. Once you get to Bottom Boat, Sustrans advise that the, uh, the route continues on a road from Bottom Boat through Stanley Ferry towards uh, Wakefield. But again, it is recognised that this route needs improvement. So everything that was... Uh, promised and consulted on 2016 is not being delivered because whichever way you go, whether you go on the canal and river path and the route fades out from being tarmac to going back to, to mud, uh, or whether you, you follow the tarmac to, to Methley and it fades out then to being, again, mud through to bottom boat and then back on the road, is not delivering the aspiration of an efficient active travel. And I think that's been replicated around all the districts. So, again, I, I would say that we as a transport committee need to see schemes if they are being amended that we have been asked to approve before. You know, just giving us schemes which is a fait accompli and decisions made elsewhere is not efficient and is destroying public confidence, Chair. So, in, so um, Councillor Bolt, thank you for your uh, summary of, of your view of the schemes. Um, so I don't know every single scheme, even though I do try, but I do know Castleford Greenway. And I know it really well. And it is a state-of-the-art scheme. It's exemplar. It's been used for walking and cycling, probably way beyond any of the other schemes across West Yorkshire. I um, doubt that. I would say, well, can I just, can I just yeah. finish, please? You've spoken, and yeah. I'd like to speak now. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the consultation, I, don't, I wasn't here in 2016, but I will certainly go back. You mm -hmm. could have emailed any of this at any time to ask for an update. For, for, to ask for the transport committee to be updated on this scheme. I've offered you briefings. I've offered you, you know, I've asked you to email. I don't get it. We don't get any of that. But then you bring it here today and expect all the answers. I'm not going to be able to give you all the answers. What I would say is I do know that the consultation changed around probably 2018-19 on, um, and it had to go back out of consultation around Methley, and I think you're talking about Stanley Bottom Boat down, down there, um, because there was, um, there was some objections from the residents in Methley. So I do know that, and we pulled the scheme and it went back out of consultation. That, that's from memory. Um, so I can't, I can't basically say about the changes of the scheme. I can't say, you know, that I can promise that I, we will bring as a strategic transport board who needs to deliver the connectivity strategy for the whole of West Yorkshire, every cycling scheme that has changed, you've got, you've, you can do this in the districts, I've got every confidence in the portfolios, holders across the district, I've got every confidence in active travel members across the district, but we need, you know, if this is something that you want to raise, Council Ball, I just need you to give me notice so we can get you the facts and the information. And we can do this in between meetings as well. Yeah, uh, as you say, we, uh, we are, well, we are the Transport Committee. In terms of um, strategic decisions, the decision on change 
um, was made, as I said, by the combined authority, the full body of the combined authority, which is even more strategic. Yeah, we are supposed to be the transport committee. So by the yeah, leaders... But we don't get... We, we are not the investment committee and the schemes are passed by, via investment committee and CA. And um, so... Again, we do, if there's a problem, and I'll look into it again, because you have raised things like this yep. in the past, yep. um, we'll, look what, we'll just have to wait and see what the new governance looks like around a mayoral authority. But I think in terms of something like this, if you just give me enough warning, we'll probably be able to get the information and the answers that you need. Um, I mean, and I think they're important things, very important. We have got to get cycling uh, schemes right, mm. because actually, if they're not the government standard, we're not going to get the funding for them. The, no, they're not going to fund the schemes. And the money could be clawed back uh, if, the, if things don't meet LTN, one, uh, LTN 120. Absolutely. And, and, and what I've said to our teams, if there's any schemes that arrive at WICA that don't meet that new guideline, then I want to see them. And I will bring them to the districts and the transport committees and the district chairs and the active travel members because we're going to have to push back on them because we, we won't get the funding. So I've got now... Sorry, could I have a, oh, sorry ch- Skelton Grange, Chair. Scott and Bridge, I'm going to bring Councillor Carhill in, if you just give me a oh. second. Chair. So Councillor Carhill. Sorry, sorry Chair. Councillor Koshik. Yeah, Kit wants to come for a long time. He wants to answer some of the questions, if you can okay. uh, give yeah. him a chance. Yeah. I, I will do. I'm just going to bring Councillor Carhill in on the first question that uh, Councillor Bot raised on, on Skelton, because Councillor Carhill is the active travel, uh, travel member for Leeds. He, he works for Councillor Hayden and he's also the district chair. Councillor um, Cahill has, has put an awful lot of energy and time um, to actually be looking at all of this scheme. So Councillor Cahill, if you just want to come in. Yeah, Chair, I'm, I'm conscious I don't want to take the um, uh, meeting off at too much of an angle, but I can give an update on Skelton Grange, and I'm <laughs> obviously more than happy to give an update to anyone that would like uh, an, an update outside of this meeting as well. I, I appreciate it is a cross-border issue. Many of the people that are engaged in it, for instance, are from the Wakefield, Wakefield district, and it's a, a good route into Leeds. I've been looking at this. So, so obviously the, the difficulties of the bridge, I think, uh, we're, we're probably all aware of in, in some way or another if we go anywhere near that end. And it came to the Climate Emergency Advisory Committee. So um, we saw a, a video of just how difficult it is just a couple of days ago in Leeds. Um, if anyone wants to see that video from the Leeds Cycling Campaign, do have a look, because I think it is... Um, I'd like to thank them for how much they've highlighted this issue and, and, and showing just how difficult it is, not only for cyclists, obviously, who have difficulty carrying their bike across that bridge, but also it's a, it's a walking route and it is inaccessible to anyone with mobility issues. If you've got a wheelchair, then it's practically impossible, I'd say, unless you've got somebody with a stretcher with you. Um, what we're looking at... so, so um, to update Councillor Bolton and, and anyone else on this, what I've been looking at is gathering all the stakeholders. So one of the issues is the bridge is actually privately owned. Uh, it's not owned or, or in the gift of the local authority to improve. Um, and, and the access actually goes up halfway across the bridge. So it's not even the, the standard entrance to the bridge. We've therefore brought all the stakeholders together. So um, departments from Leeds City Council, um, kits there now. Um, it was Ambrose who was in the in the previous meeting in terms of the combined authority, uh, Canal and River Trust, the Trans Pennine Trail themselves, obviously. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think, so I, I make sure I've got all of them. But also the private landowners around that area as well, because it is a um, a melting pot of different land ownerships. Um, we've had one meeting. Um, at the end of last year and we're meeting again actually this afternoon just to bottom out what the correct um, approach is in following up opportunities so uh, the last meeting we agreed two possible um, things to look into further um, we discounted um, looking for improvements in the current bridge because they've been investigated for, for many times. So the option is either to look for funding for a new bridge, but that's something that um, would have to come forward probably to, to the combined authority and, uh, and we'd have to look whether it's feasible. But the other opportunity is a route through the Thwaite Mill Estate, which is obviously just there. That has the benefit that it avoids you having to go over this bridge, but it also avoids you having to get over the next bridge further along. Um, I think Ambrose's point, point um uh, from the combined authority were most useful on that really we can't look at 
asking for funding for a new bridge when one there's a much cheaper alternative possibly to go through the nearby land that is much more accessible and two that the the rest of the route is not necessarily a fully accessible route so there are other struggles on that route so uh, i'll i'll leave that there because that gives you a bit of an update of where we're going to um there's another meeting this afternoon with the stakeholders. I'm intending that there's minutes on there that are published probably by Lead Cycling Campaign, I think, to, as, as the organisation that have really brought this to, to a head. But if anyone does want more updating in where we're going, more than happy to, to, to give that update. Thank you, Councillor Cahill. So I've got Kit who wants to come back on, Councillor Bott's question. Then I've got Councillor Swift, Councillor Homewood and Councillor Campbell. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gores. I'll be as brief as I can. I just wanted to um, uh, essentially... Similarly to, to Councillor Carlyle, give that uh, that we're meeting this afternoon on Skelton Grange, so I look forward to seeing him there. We can carry on the good the good works um, there. It's interesting that uh, he flies the Castleford Wakefield Greenway straight after the Skelton Grange thing because I don't know if he's aware that we recently. Uh, has been awarded an open country award for disabled access to the countryside by Yorkshire country uh, thing, which, is, which is excellent to see and we're obviously very keen that as we go forward we take out barriers that make it not inaccessible and it make the uh, cycle network across West Yorkshire accessible to, to all. Um, the other point I wanted to talk to speaks both to uh, Councillor Campbell's questions and also to Councillor Bolts which is that um, we're very keen to engage with the public and learn where they want facilities. The Safer Streets consultation over the summer was a really exciting sort of opportunity for us to dig in and get a lot of feedback from where there's, you know, where there are barriers, where there's potential for something new. And we're currently processing all of that into this pipeline of schemes that I was talking about. And we hope to set up a more consistent and ongoing engagement approach um, going forward as part of this. And, we, and I'm working very closely with Farah and others in as to how we do that. Um, one of the issues that we've had with our engagement and with um, to bring in Councillor Bolt's point about, you know, the Castlefield Breakfield Greenway being a bit um, bitty at moment is that obviously consistently in active travel, our funding has so far usually been awarded by competition or it's by in one year chunks or it's uh, you know usually quite sort of distributed and quite hard to pull together across different pots of money. Um, one thing that's really exciting about the DFT's new commitment to active travel is that after this year, they are proposing a multi-year funding settlement based on the strength of our pipeline uh, for us to develop things over years, which not only enable us to look at potentially more complicated projects, for example, the, the bridge over um, at Skelton Grange as an alternative is an example, would be very hard to, to, to study and deliver within a year within one set of funding. So hopefully we can you know, stretch out more complicated projects like that, but it also enables us to bring schemes forward, develop them one year, and then they're ready for the next year's capital spend, rather than at the moment where we might draw something up so far, but we've only got little bits of money to do that with, and they sit in a drawer for five years, then we need to update it again because we get a bit more money, and so it's a very dis um, disjointed process. So hopefully going forward, not only we'll be able to engage in a more uh, direct and ongoing way, but we'll also be able to develop the schemes in response to that engagement and be ready to invest in them in a sort of sort of trundling process which will help us enable uh, to access more to people more steadily. Thank you. Thank you, Kit. I've got Councillor Swift and then Councillor Homewood. Yes, Chair, thank you. Uh, got, I, I, I've got to be honest and say I got slightly confused um, by the question in terms of the exact kind of sections we were talking about in the in the area around bottom boat and stanley ferry um but i'm i'm more than happy to actually get that get to the bottom of this and get and, and sort that out with councillor bolt outside this meeting um they absolutely no problem at all yes kevin thank you councillor swift councillor homewood thanks chair we just mentioned um a couple of positive things, I suppose, from a Kirkley's perspective, um, in terms of the um, some of the schemes. Uh, you know, just to say in terms of the Bradley to, to Brighouse Greenway. You know, I see that as a real benefit for people in my ward because uh, I represent sort of the Bradley area. Um, you know, I think that's a really key key piece of infrastructure because actually getting to and from um, that part of my Kirkley's into Brighouse actually, you know, distance-wise, it's a lot closer than Huddersfield, but it's not probably easy to get there walking or cycling. And I think when you think of the housing growth in both in Kirklees and Calderdale in that area, I think it's a really positive thing that we can put infrastructure in place before that happens. We're always talking about this in terms of public transport and we're actually being able to deliver on that. 
Um, and just in terms of the Huddersfield Narrow Canal, you know, again, that's, you know, an excellent piece of um, infrastructure to, you know, to get between Huddersfield and up, you know, as far as uh, Marsden, you know, and currently at the moment you get to certain points and it's just not properly accessible for people, particularly if you're cycling or disability, etc. So I think, you know, I just wanted to point out that some of the issues, you know, are not, not all schemes are 100% perfect, but I think there's there's some real positives that we should mention that as well, as well as the problems that we're, we're seeing. Thanks, Chair. You're on mute You're again, on mute Jim. <laughs> Councillor Bolt. Yeah, thanks. Just Thank to come you, back. Councillor Homewood. Can, I'd, I'd like to invite then Councillor Homewood to come on a bike with me on the routes that he's just been praising. Um, the, the canal towpath from Huddersfield to Marsden is not accessible. It's, it's a linear route. It runs alongside many homes whose only access into Huddersfield is down Manchester Road. They can't access this route because there's a big wall in the way. Uh, the, the Bradley to Brighouse um, route, I'm not sure if he's aware that when it went to the scrutiny committee, it missed out the, uh, the path which was going to go through the Ashbrow Ward. It's now, again, a linear route along most, most of the same alignment as the Cooper Bridge um, bypass, which is still under consideration. But James, when you get to um, the A62 in, in your ward, there is no plans for the, uh, the Bradley to Brighouse route to safely cross the A62. So for people coming from North Kirklees who may want to go from Murfield to Brighouse, they would have to come round Cooper Bridge and then cross five lanes of traffic to get onto a cycle route. They're just going to stay on the, on the main road. And I'd, I'd invite you to come out for a, a bike ride with me and I'll show you the difficulties of that. It, it, is well, it is well known and it's something that has not been addressed by officers. I think when everybody can meet, I'm sure that Council Homeward and Council Caution could be more than pleased to yeah, no, go down Chair, those roads. I was just going to say to that, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I suppose we can't cycle on something until it's actually there. But um, no, no, I mean, you yeah. can. The, the, route is, the route is there, James. Uh, I've used it for many years and it, you can cycle at the moment because you're allowed to go out with two people cycling. Uh, again, we do that. And shortly, we'll be able to go up to the glorious and strange number of 15 people cycling. I don't know how they <laughs> arrive at that, but... Uh, I mean, you could, I could take you out this weekend to let you have a look at that, James. Well, we're not supposed no, to be meeting. We're not you, supposed to be meeting at it's all. It's not meeting, it's exercise, Chair. Well, you can go out for cycle yeah. exercise. With yeah, but you cyclists, I've seen you when you all stand together. Anyway, so, um, Councillor Koshik. Councillor Bolt, uh, after the election, we were all going to be free uh, to come <laughs> with you. And I've been keep asking you to send me the invite and I will join you, definitely. Okay. And I know Kit is, uh, Councillor Swift, have you, is that an, a legacy hand? I want the invite also, as Councillor Salam from Bradford. Also, I want the invite also, also because... Yeah. Uh, I just need to oh. forewarn the committee who want to jump in and join this um, uh, this, this this bike, bike ride that Councillor Bo and Councillor Salam are professional cyclists. So <laughs> I'll be they bringing are. the electric bike. Um, so, and, and, and I would say to you, Councillor, well, I really admire you and Councillor Sam, you know, how you champion cycling and, and you love the award behind you. Um, but we've got families who are out cycling for the first time. We've got people who don't get in the lycra, cycling and walking, and, and they don't actually notice all these things. And do you know what? I'm absolutely delighted because West York is a brilliant place to walk and cycle. Um, and, and we should have that aspiration to have yeah. those high standard routes. But, you know, we get in there and we just need to remember that we need to talk it up. And, you know, um, I don't, I don't and obviously, think, I don't think Taj is wearing like on that photo behind me when he can get through <laughs> a barrier. Yeah, good. I will ask him to put his uh, camera off then. <laughs> OK, <laughs> right. We can we note the uh, report and move on to the next item, which is item eight. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, so item eight is the carbon impact assessment. As you all know, we have a really robust um, assurance framework. That all our schemes go through at WICA. One of the things that this, um, the investment committee and transport committee wanted to look at was putting a carbon lens on all those uh, schemes. The work is groundbreaking that's being led by WICA. Um, I've got Patrick Bowes here who can talk to it far more knowledgeably than I can. So I'm just going to hand over to Patrick but, you know, I just want to, um, you know, say how delighted I think most members will be that this work is being pursued. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, uh, the purpose of this report is to update the Transport Committee on the progress that we're making in development of a, an impact assessment methodology to apply in our future business case decision making. Uh, the item was last discussed uh, um, uh, uh, at the 15th of January meeting of the uh, Transport Committee and uh, a similar updating item was also taken to the 4th of, this, of March uh, in an investment committee meeting and the uh, 9th of March uh, combined authority meeting. Um, the report outlines the project in its phases. Uh, I won't go into the, the, the details of those phases. The project now is uh, partway through uh, phase three, which is where we're looking at uh, an assessment of existing projects uh, in the transport fund uh, and an initial uh, subset of projects are being reviewed uh, in order to help refine and develop the approach uh, that we will use to testing uh, the uh, the full list of projects. Um, since the uh, the um, the last update to the transport committee and the last full update to the com combined authority, uh, consultants uh, uh, managing the project have made recommendations uh, which uh, will improve our approach to the assessment of carbon in our business cases. These include. Uh, a qualitative a recommendation for a qualitative assessment of carbon impacts early in the development of schemes, and that fits in with the uh, changes to the developing changes to the assurance framework. Uh, a quantitative assessment of carbon impact for both transport and non-transport projects um, in, in our business case assurance process. The, the quantitative assessments uh, should include emissions associated with construction uh, as well as those uh, associated with use. So that would also be a change in, a, in, in our approach. And that the economic assessment of, of, of the carbon impact that we currently undertake should also uh, be consistent with the assumptions that are being developed through the carbon emissions reduction pathways work as well. It's worth flagging up to the committee members that the methodology will develop and change as we test projects at this early stage. Um, and, and then we apply that methodology to the full, the full list of, uh, of, of uh, current projects uh, in, in the transport fund. Um, we've had extensive discussions with officers and partner councils in development of, of this work, which included directors, regular engagement with director of development and chief highways officers, uh, along with detailed workshops with a wide range of local authority uh, officers. We've also held briefing sessions with leaders and portfolio leads, uh, and these have been facilitated by uh, Councillor Groves. In terms of the next steps with the project, um, the focus is on completing the assessment of the uh, existing projects. Uh, that's phase three of the project. Uh, in phase four, we'll be looking at a subset of, of projects um, from that list to explore how we can uh, develop the design of, of those projects to look at any issues around mitigation. Uh, we'll obviously be continuing work to integrate the results from this project into the ongoing review of the assurance framework and obviously a really important part of this project as well uh, which is phase five is uh, developing training material and providing support to combined authority officers local authority officers and elected members in terms of how we will implement these uh, uh, changes into our assurance process so hopefully that gives committee members an update as to progress on the uh, on the project and uh, the committee are asked to note the uh, the progress that's being made and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Patrick. I've got Councillor de Gorm. Yes, um, I was interested to see the, the, this uh, item and particularly on next steps. Uh, I just wonder, is there some way of um, members finding out which projects are at phase three? I mean, I just like I'm aware of a project that, that we have, um, the, the Outer Ring Road, which is at the stage now where um, we're looking at the detailed design, um, potentially going forward to, to planning this coming year. So it's like whether whether that would be looked at at, at this point or, or whether that's sort of gone beyond phase three, I don't know. Should I respond to that, Councillor Grove? Yeah, yes, please, Patrick. I was trying to think yes, which scheme um, it was. Yes, indeed. Yes, I mean we can we can provide sort of you know further information to members on the on the on the schemes that are that are that are being looked at, and um, so yes, we can we That'd can provide that information. Thank you. And just, I was just wondering, obviously, rather than everyone looking, is there somewhere online that which actually lists? I mean, think it'd be useful for members if you could actually sort of if you have a a, a list of which projects are what at what stage. If there's a is there a quarterly report or something like that that 
we can identify the, which ones you're looking at rather than everybody asking you. Yes, the, the, there is a there is a list that we have produced, so we can we can we can we can share that with members. Thank you. Yeah. I think I think it's fair to say, though, Patrick, that's still quite an early stage, isn't it? It is indeed at a, in terms a, a, of that analysis. Stage, so right? I'm not it's sure, sure that, when that this could be reviewed. Uh, yeah, uh, so it's okay. certainly a work in progress, but we you know we can supply that information. Okay, thank you. Any more questions or comments on this item? No. Right. Thank you, Patrick. And okay. uh, if members would just like to note the recommendations and we look forward to hearing more as this crucial work moves forward. Thank you. So we are now on to um, item nine, which is the Leeds City Region Transport update. Um, I'm sure that everybody has read uh, the information. This is just as an update on the bus expert panel where LIPTIP is the funding and existing local pinch point fund that has just been the districts put their schemes forward on and the DFT future of uh, transport rural strategy. So any questions or comments on that item? Council Bolton, Council Buckley, I've got Liz here as well, I think, and Dave. Thanks, Chair. Um, just on page 51, um, item the restoring your railway fund obviously um, again something that I think a lot of us would be in, in agreement with that the former railway lines should be preserved and protected um, either for future transit at whatever time but in the immediate they can be used for, for greenways and I just wonder did, did Wyker put any bids in and in particular did, did Wyker uh, bid for anything towards the, the, uh, the Queensbury tunnel um, it does sound, I'm sure, again, colleagues will probably j join my scepticism that passing railway infrastructure to the highways England, who are a motorway body, does seem rather perverse. Uh, they'd be far better uh, held either with um, Sustrans uh, as their, the Rail Property Board or with somebody else who has got an understanding of them. But yeah, I'd like to see the Queensry Tunnel uh, preserved and protected and delivered for transport in the future. I'm not sure where we are with the Queensbury Tunnel. I do seem to recall there was something in the devolution deal um, around Queensbury Tunnel. I just want to bring Liz in our um, yeah. Dave. Hi, thank you, Councillor Groves. Um, so I think um, members will remember, I can't remember what, what time it was last, last year, but the government um, allocated um, some funding um, between Highways England um, and ourselves with, with Bradford um council to look at the options for active travel including the queensby tunnel um, so this was to look at the, the the different route options as well as the the costs associated with that including um kind of opening the queensby tunnel um, that work is still on ongoing um between um highways england um and the council um I don't have in to hand the, the dates of, of when the work is going to be completed, but I, I know work is is progressing. Um, so you, you haven't missed anything on on that. We haven't put therefore any bids forward for anything further on the Queensbury Tunnel yet, because I think we're waiting to see the conclusions of the work um, in order to understand what the options are and the costs are, and then there'll be no doubt a conversation back with the Department of Transport um, on that. Um, so as as the paper says. Um, the Restoring Your Railway Fund, um, for the reasons explained in the paper, we haven't put anything um, forward through this stage. Councillor Rochelle, would you like to come in on the Queensbury Tunnel? Yeah, I mean, not, not a right lot to add, thanks to that, Liz. Um, obviously, we share your um, ambition, Council Bolt, as well, and, and that's fed through the Combined Authority as well. It's protected in our local plan, which we're currently consulting on too. Um, so officers are just doing that work. What we're trying to do as well is kind of piece together a bit of a network either side of it as well. So you start to strengthen that strategic case. So that's why we'd want to look at, say, cycleways up Thornton Road, et cetera, um, through transforming cities, which then starts to create link out to Thornton, which we can then drop down to Queensbury Tunnel, work with a Great Northern Railway trail about that whole stretch as well and the feasibility they want to do to get tech up the Northern Railway Trail up to Cullingworth and Keithley as well. So you start to see this kind of district-wide and regional cycle network. So obviously, um, you know, we work with the government um, and lobby the government, as do Wiker, on, on funding. We're pleased to get the funding, um, but they decide where it goes. So um, they'll hire the people they need to do the assessments and we'll liaise with stakeholders and, 
you know, we want to make sure the right experts are in the room to make sure that that's um, viewed in as strong a light as, as possible with a really strong evidence base. So that works underway. Uh, then it'll go back to the further discussions with the government, which I'm sure will come back before it will be involved with about what we can do to um, kind of deliver that. And then in the interim period, obviously, there'll be discussions around if any works are needed to just keep it secure as well. And, and that's, again, something we'd expect to be at the table for as well. Thank you, Chair. Well, I haven't been to the Queensbury and I think it's one of the, the only places I haven't been, but isn't, would that be the longest cycling tunnel in Europe then? I think it's up there. I think it's one of those where um, the detail, um, if you're not careful, it, it kind of changes to longest in Europe, sometimes yes. longer in Europe, longer the longest in the UK. It's certainly, once you get over a mile, you, you're looking at one of the longest. So it'd be a mm. nationally significant um, yeah. basically. And, um, you know, you can visit the tunnel. We just stand outside it when we go these days. But obviously they're inside <laughs> to, to keep it secure as and when necessary. But yeah, absolutely. It'd be nationally significant as well as regionally significant. You think about that area as well with the viaducts, um, yeah. just the actual kind of landscape of that area is absolutely amazing. So we do try and stress that to government. do not always get picked up in your BCRs and that kind of, not reductive debate, but can be quite technical debate. But there is something about the heritage of the area, the culture and the place, that this is a really unique okay. Community and it's good to have uh, the backing of a combined authority and cross-party support as well has always been important. And we've been yeah. you painted a great narrative there, Alex. Thank you. Um, okay, so any more questions or comments on, on this item? Sure. Um, can, Dave, can, yes, I just, of course. Can, I, can I just just clarify something we were talking about earlier uh, and, and point members to 2.45 in the report? Um, uh, it, earlier we were do talking about um, travelling from Motley to Dewsbury and, and, and on a single ticket and uh, just in, in the last couple of uh, weeks we, we've, we've developed a, 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 an MCARD mobile phone app um, where people can buy day tickets to, to travel on, on bus or rail. So somebody in Otley could buy a ticket uh, to travel all the way through to Dewsbury, catching the X84 in, into Leeds uh, by bus, and then the train from, from Leeds to, to, to Dewsbury on the same ticket. So, we, and this, we, um, we're fairly confident, is the first time that uh, a sort of mobile phone day ticket on bus and rail has been launched. And I know there's lots of discussions around the ticketing options uh, for uh, responding to people's changed working and shopping habits. Um, and this is our sort of first stab at it. And um, there's more to go with it, uh, with this app, um, because we, we, it then gives us opportunities to, uh, to, to, to be able to um, work with, with key partners in terms of reducing the, uh, uh, the cost of travel for people like job seekers and others. So um, just, just really, it's a bit of a first, and I think it's probably worth marking that. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us, me of that. I know we've had a soft launch, but it, I know it's going well. So yeah, yeah, yeah good we, work. We, we'll give it good publicity when yeah. um, when it's the right time to. When we're sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dave. So can we just note the recommendations and move to the next item? I think Councillor Buckley wants to speak. Oh, Councillor Buckley, sorry, you're waving. Were you... Right, OK. Councillor Buckley. It was a very, very brief question, Shay, if I can. Of course. The top of page 46, um, it's under the Transport for the North uh, meeting. Uh, the Trans Pennine Tunnel M6 to A1. And I just wondered if somebody could just refresh my memory as to what that actually is or might be. I can't remember what, what that is, Liz. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Thanks, Cousin. Sorry, I'm just trying to scroll to the right page. This is the. Um, uh the the road study isn't it not the um so it's sorry. the um yes sorry i've got it so um so yes if if um you may recall again i can't remember the exact date but a previous secretary of state for transport wanted to ask the highways england to look at road options um across um the, the pennines um so thinking about the um uh the link where the uh, I think this is the kind of East Lancashire into West Yorkshire connections. Um, so the Highways England have been looking at that, 
but for lots of reasons, including cost, environmental concerns, etc., um, the conclusion is that, as it's as it says here, um, the importance is is recognised, but there might be other ways of achieving that rather than the approach that Highways England have set out. So, Council Buckley, there is a um, there will be a paper on that within the the TFN. Um, papers. So if you'd like me to dig it out for you, I can I can send you the link and then you can see a little bit more of the, of the details, but that's the, that's the background. Okay. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next um, item, which is the summary of the transport schemes. Um, this was from the Transport Committee um, and the invest and the West Yorkshire and York Investment Committee, so the recent um, Investment Committee. So any questions or comments on the schemes that have gone through the investment committee? No, I think so. Happy to that report to be noted then and take in silence of the yes. Thank you so much. And then item 11 is the draft minutes of the district consultation subcommittees. Um, I'm taking it, is there any Anything that anyone would, want, anyone would want to raise on that? We've got the next set of district committees starting on Monday with Councillor Carhill, who will be launching the uh, Connected to Strategy in the Leeds area. So um, no questions or comments on that. Okay. And that, I think, is the end of the meeting. I didn't think I would do that in two hours, but we've got there, so... So that's good. Thank you so much all for um, your attendance today. Good luck, um, everyone who is up for election. You know, uh, uh, stay safe. We have got uh, the next transport committee. We're hoping that Chris Boardman may be um, attending. And so all those who are cyclists, I'm sure, will be really pleased um, about that. And also, we're going to try and see if we can have a discussion around freight as well, uh, which is a really important of part. Uh, and part of the connectivity strategy and the um, climate challenge. So um, stay safe, everyone, and I'll see you um, soon at the next meeting. Thank you. See you all later. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye. See you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye.